So welcome everyone, okay, to the new meeting of this uh, integrative. So we are getting quite integrated, I guess. So that's very good. Okay, and uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Leo Vanne today. So uh, a colleague uh, uh, actually was finding out about the life of, of Leo right now. So Leo got his PhD in the University of Saarland, actually relatively late, so in 97. So it seems that he had a lot of fun before. Uh, I uh, got a PhD, <laughs> and he has been around in Barcelona here at the Pompeu Fabra since 2005, sort of as the founder and, 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 and directing the group of natural language. Okay, so it has uh, specifically more focus normally on the natural language generation, but I will talk about a number of uh, issues that have to do with natural language processing today. So, with the further ado, so Leo, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Hector. So, uh, hello everybody, uh, thanks for coming. So the title uh, might look a little bit uh, pretentious, no? So, but, uh, okay, so what it's supposed to suggest is that natural language processing is nowadays much more popular than it used to be in former times. No? So, but uh, you will agree that I couldn't put such a prosaic statement you know, as a title, so I looked for a more fancy one. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today. So that present the uh, research activities of our group. So then uh, uh, very briefly sketch how our activities fit into larger applications and then finally conclude with uh, stating what natural language processing is in general good for. Okay, so natural language processing. Not all of you might be very familiar with natural language processing, so what is it about? So at the very general level, it's a very simple thing. Simple thing. So what we are doing is to, uh, to look for the definition of a function which maps an element uh, of the domain A to an element or a subset of elements of the codomain B. So that's far. But obviously things get a little bit more complicated if we look into A and we look into B. So what can be A? A can be first, can be an audio signal if we're talking about speech. So it can be a text, it can be a whole pile of texts, and it can be a formal representation. Here we see a more uh, linguistically oriented formal representation, or it can be a, uh, an ontological representation. You know? So a very abstract representation, which is very popular nowadays in semantic web applications. So if we look at B, so then again, uh, uh, it can be speech, it can be a text, it can be, again, a formal representation, a linguistically oriented formal representation, or again, an ontological representation, but it can be also something really very different. It can be, for example, only two classes, male, female. If we are looking for the identification of the gender of the author of the text, or it can be uh, minus plus, if we are looking for the general sentiment of a text, now whether it has a positive attitude, whether it has a negative attitude, or it can be, well, whatever uh, we can think of, a sequence of text, a sequence of, or a set of classes. Okay, so let's now uh, group this a little bit and assume that we have as input natural language and output a formal representation. So then, if we have uh, speech and the output is a sequence of prosodic contours, so then what we're doing is prosody analysis. Now, if we have a text or a pile of texts and we get out a linguistic representation, a syntactic structure, let's say, so then we are doing parsing. And we are doing a natural language understanding if the result is an ontological representation. Yeah? Okay, so if we get a sequence of morphological text, so then obviously we are doing morphological tagging or morphological analysis, and if the classes or text look a different way, so then we, uh, we are doing probably oh, um, lexical analysis. Okay, Oop. That's, uh, and uh, if our output is a, a sequence of emotional, let's say, text. So then we are doing sentiment analysis. And here, no, so if we are, uh, yeah, my, with minus or plus or whatever, so then maybe we are looking for the detection of uh, 
a sarcastic piece or a satiric piece or whatever. No? And male, female, we already have this. This uh, might be about uh, author gender uh, recognition. Okay, so if we're not, so this doesn't work properly. Okay, so uh, if we have as input natural language and as output, we have natural language as well. So then what we are uh, doing is uh, document summarization or text summarization can be multiple document. No, if we look at those piles of, uh, of text, can be paraphrasing or simplification of texts. No? So, and it can be also machine translation. No? So we get natural language and we put out natural language. And if we have at both sides for uh, speech, then we do, pro for example, prosody translation. Obviously, we can also imagine here uh, speech as input and text as output if we are doing, um, for example, uh, uh, language transcription. Okay, and now then if we have formal representation as uh, input and natural language as output. So then uh, what we do is uh, multilingual, maybe, or monolingual text generation from a formal representation. No? So again, this uh, representation can be uh, closer to the language surface or uh, uh, away, further away from the language surface. Okay, so what we're doing? Uh, from all of this, no? so basically everything, no? or quite a lot. No? So uh, our research topics in the group can be grouped into two uh, fields or two areas, two broad areas, so that's natural language analysis, and this is prosody analysis, parsing, understanding of written spoken discourse, lexical analysis, and here we are also looking into second language uh, learning context, as we'll see later. So then a very important aspect is the meta-analysis of written discourse. And here, several members of the group are into sentiment analysis, figurative language recognition, and uh, author profiling. Natural language production here, we are, so that's based, uh, yeah, uh, the more traditional areas of the group as um, uh, Hector mentioned. So we do con uh, content to text, content to speech, and here more recently synchronization with mimics, speech synchronization with mimics with, uh, with the lip movements, as we will see, and then text to text generation that is summarization, paraphrasing, and simplification. And prosody translation is again a uh, more recent field we're working in. Okay, so we are apart from. Um, our research topics, we have a couple of application areas. So we are uh, working on, so the first one and the, the oldest one, that's uh, patent material processing there. We are already for 10 years or so into summarization of patents, analysis of patents and uh, the uh, representation of the content and visualization. And here we are collaborating with a number of companies with the, um, European Patent Office and with other institutions. So the other um, application area, that's text simplification. This is mainly Horatio's application area. And there we are developing portals for end users for text simplification. And the last one, that's uh, language learning. And here we are focusing on what we call collocation checkers for learners, and we'll see in a couple of minutes, we'll see what we mean by collocation uh, and what we mean by collocation check. Huh? Okay, so, um, well, uh, in order to put a handle on this um, function f, I mentioned at the beginning, and uh, all these different topics, it's uh, very useful to look at the level of processing uh, within each topic. Huh? And here we have three different levels again, that's uh, sentence or utterance. So then we have a text document and we have a text collection you know, or document collection. <clears throat> and each of uh, these levels has obviously a, uh, a representation model, a processing model associated with it. And at the sentence level, so we have, we work with um, dependency language model, and uh, 
here at the text level, that's a lexical distribution model and discourse structure model. We'll see this uh, in, a, in a minute. And then text collection, document collection. So that's again, that's basically lexical distribution. So in my talk, I'll focus mainly on these two uh, mo different models. Okay, so uh, now a little bit more details on the on the processing model. Huh? Before we then we will look into how we do it. Uh, so well, so this is uh, our uh, sentence representation model. So as you see, so we have we have quite a quite a few layers there. So um, the the first layer that's uh, phonology, surface phonology, that's well, basically speech. So then deep phonology, what we have here right now, so these are all features we need for uh, prosody analysis and prosody generation. Uh, then we have uh, topology, morphology. Actually, these are two, again, two sub-layers, you know, surface morphology and deep morphology, but it's not important that this stage here, you know, so you see that here we all we get some text you know, which identify John as a proper no, uh, noun thing, as an inflected verb, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know? So then we have uh, surface syntax, which is a syntactic structure, surface-oriented syntactic structure, and uh, uh, we know these labels, you know, subject, or direct object, etc., from back from school, you know? so a long time ago. You know? So we learned about subject object. You know? And here we are recycle those notions. At the uh, deep syntactic level, we have already uh, a more abstract representation, but it's still syntactic. And here we go down then towards semantics and deep semantics, and uh, here below that's the ontological representation. No, over sentence. Okay, so in this model in itself, that's already a research topic. No? So and here, so I uh, I show the, the the pictures of the people here. No, so sitting over there. No, uh, people mainly involved in uh, in the uh, these respective research topics. No, and here I uh, from time to time I mentioned some reference publications. Uh, I didn't have the space to spell them out. No, but if you are interested, no, so then please uh, let me know, no, and I will give you the complete reference and the publication it's, it's itself. No, okay. So it's uh, Simon uh, Mill, uh, Alicia Burga, uh, who are dealing with this part here, no, and uh, Monica Dominguez, uh, who takes care of the phonological stuff. Okay. So now, so we have these uh, the description, the, the layers. No, so but we're still away from our function f. No, now, so what basically uh, what we do is to see how we can, let's say, uh, establish correspondences between different layers of the, represent uh, of the representation at the sentence level. No? So that is, if we, for example, do uh, prosody analysis, so what the whole story is about, so this is to map, to find uh, an accurate mapping between this representation and what we want to get here. If we are doing parsing, so what we want to, then we have a written sentence here. No? So basically John thinks that his professor has been witched. And this example, and then we uh, go down either to this layer or to this layer. We can do it step by step. No? So from one layer to another layer, or we can uh, skip a couple of layers and then go directly from the surface, for example, to deep syntax. No? So that dep depends on our approach. And also, if we, are, uh, we can st uh, stay at the same layer, no? if we are doing, for example, paraphrasing, so there is no need uh, uh, to go from one layer to another. So we are, what we are doing here to find a mapping between two let's say, equivalent or nearly equivalent representations. Okay, and uh, so this is, this is the whole story. No? And in more, let's say, um, processing terms, what this means, that uh, what we're doing is classification. No? And what we're doing is uh, graph transduction. 
So these two, let's say, uh, instruments uh, are used to do the whole processing at the sentence level. Okay, why uh, classification? So if we go back, so then if we take this, uh, this layer here, we want to get there. So what we do is to classify the subject relation, for example, in terms of the relations which the subject can be mapped to uh, at this layer. No? So, and we, we take the direct object and we want, we want to classify how this uh, uh, translates into, into this layer. No? So, and a graph transduction, that's even more straightforward. So what we are doing uh, is to, uh, to define, to develop graph grammars, which are uh, capable of mapping all representations at one layer to the representation, uh, to a representation, a correct representation at the next adjacent la uh, layer. No? And this is the whole, uh, the whole story. No? So classification and uh, graph transduction. Okay, so let me now very briefly go through the different uh, um, topics, research topics at the sentence uh, level and uh, explain how we're doing it, more or less. Uh, so prosody analysis, so the, the goal of prosody analysis is to derive from the acoustic signal to derive uh, proso what we call prosodic phrases, prosodic words, and prosodic contours, and uh, so what we see here. No, so it's not important, let's say, uh, I will not go into details here what the individual symbols mean, so I think it's not important there. But what is important and what is novel here in our research is that we use, in order to derive the, uh, the prosodic contour, you know, so how we speak, how expressive our speech is, you know, uh, that we draw upon uh, acoustic features, that's intensity, pitch, and duration, and at the same time, linguistic features. I think for the time being, or in the state of the art, what people do is uh, focus either only on acoustic features or take some of the uh, linguistic features, first of all, syntax and uh, some lexical features into account. And uh, this, let's say, hierarchical uh, representation here of the prosodic structure allows us to be, uh, allows us to be much more accurate. Okay, and uh, so for this we use uh, supervised machine learning. So uh, for the time being we experimented with uh, several classifiers from the Weka environment. And uh, let's see you know, so whether we can talk to machine learning people here at the department in order to get something more advanced and, and better. No? Okay, and uh, uh, the members of the group involved here in, uh, in this research, that's Monica Dominguez, that's her PhD thesis, Mireya Farus and Alicia Burga. And the uh, reference publications here are two publications and the speech prosody last year. Okay, and prosody generation, just the, the other way around. No? So we start from a, uh, a syntactic structure. Uh, we add the, what we call communicative structure, that is information structure, theme ream, what we are talking about, what we are saying, what we want to emphasize, etc., etc. This comes from uh, the, uh, let's say, deeper levels, and we map then this onto um, prosodic contours and acoustic features. No? And uh, as I said, so here at this layer, uh, layer we, all, we have only linguistic features available. And um, okay, again, no, so the same, the same story. So uh, we use uh, classifications for this. Okay, uh, now, uh, so something I mentioned that we do it um, uh, quite recently. So the idea is to, and uh, this, since we're working together with uh, Joseph's group and with Xavier uh, Benefa's group in a project, so. Um, we realized that the avatars or the, the agents, so how they move the lips is rather unnatural if we look closely at it. You know? So that, in other uh, words, that speech and lip movements are not synchronized well. You know? So And uh, obviously it has a lot to do with phonetics. So And what we do now is to, um, to develop a system which is able to to take prosody parameters and facial action point correlations and 
uh, uh, synchronize better. No? And, uh, okay. Uh, so, and this is uh, John Pera Sanchez, who is doing this in collaboration, as I said, no? so with uh, Giuseppe's people and with, uh, with uh, first of all, Federico. Okay, so now syntactic parsing. Uh, if we take uh, a sentence and we get uh, to this structure, no? so then uh, this will subject, object, etc., so then we are doing surface syntactic parsing. Okay, uh, so um, this we, we can do uh, again, either going through the two layers, you know, or we can develop what people usually do uh, is to get straight on to the surface syntax, skipping or take in one, doing it in one shot. You know? So uh, this uh, is a result to be better. So uh, usually we use um, transition-based parsing strategy that is we start from the left of uh, with the first word of the sentence and we we'll go through the sentence taking word by word. No, uh, so, uh, in contrast to the, uh, the other main approach to parsing where we start building a syntactic tree from the root, no? so just from top down to the bottom. The advantage of the transition-based parser is that it's uh, linear in time, no? and uh, so that is, it's much faster than uh, a graph-based uh, parser. And what, uh, well, uh, so the, the trick here, or the challenge, let's say, is to find uh, an accurate model. Accurate model for uh, establishing those relations between tokens. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously for this we need a large, relatively large training corpora annotated with those, uh, with those structures. And in order to learn this model, how to assign and when to assign what relation. So we use uh, SVMs and um, uh, very recently uh, stack LSTMs. So that's a variant of recurrent neural networks, which uh, uh, work really very, very good. And uh, this uh, basically this is uh, Miguel Ballesteros' work. Uh, he already published it uh, together with uh, several colleagues from the CMU where he is uh, now. And, uh, okay, so this is the best parser we have, uh, or existing parser. So if you wa uh, want or if you need to use a syntactic parser for uh, analyzing your language, so this is the parser you should use. So that the best you can get uh, now, nowadays um, in the research community. You know? Okay, so then if we um, go further, you know, so to this structure, you know, so more abstract, now here we have already fewer nodes. So then what we do is to combine a surface parser with a deep parser and we use a, a so-called hypernode approach. Hypernode, basically a, a node which consists of several nodes. No? So uh, simplified. Why? Because the uh, standard, let's say, statistical parsers, so they um, rely upon isomorphy between structures. No? And here we see that we cannot rely, no? so there is no isomorphy. No? So, and, that's, and, to, and in order to, uh, to provide a solution to this problem, so what we do, we, we pack nodes, several nodes into one hypernode, and then we simulate, uh, let's say, isomorphy. Mm? And um, okay, so here Miguel is also the, um, one uh, of the main figures, and Simon, and we have published this work also in uh, several uh, first-rate uh, events. And again, no, so this is, this is the only parser you can get uh, of this kind. No? So which gets uh, that, uh, let's say, deep and still syntactic. Okay, so uh, from uh, parsing, there is only one step to uh, language analysis. And that is we, what we want to do here, or what we're doing here, is to go from deep syntax down to an ontological representation. No? So here and uh, here in between we have semantics. So this is uh, a standard predicate argument structure, nothing else. And uh, here deep semantics. Here uh, the linguists um, among you will recognize that these are, let's say, um, here uh, 
uh, semantic roles used in standard resources. And here, for example, FR uh, stands for uh, FrameNet. So we use standard uh, lexical resources like VorbNet, FrameNet, BabelNet in order to map first to this layer and then to this layer. No? So and uh, what we do is uh, graph transduction. And as I just mentioned, no, so we use our uh, existing resources because it turned out to be very, very uh, useful. Also because, for example, BabelNet uh, allows us to be multilingual, no? to get the connection between concepts of different languages. OK, and here, uh, so uh, Simon is involved, Gerard Casamayor and, um, and Stamatia. So she is responsible, first of all, for this uh, uh, ontological part. OK, so sentence generation. No? So it goes always no? so the one way and then the other way. No? So generation. So uh, again, no? so this is basically uh, yeah, just reverse. And um, uh, here what we do, we use uh, uh, SVM so far uh, and working on a, on a deep learning approach as well. So uh, uh, using this hypernode strategy. OK, and uh, if you want to look uh, into uh, this work, no, so there are, again, some reference publications. OK, and uh, the ontology to deep syntax, so we use graph transduction grammars. OK, uh, so text simplification, text paraphrasing. No? So one, uh, now we, uh, we went from uh, the top to the bottom, and from the bottom to the top. Now we are, let's say, in the horizontal layer. So um, what is it about? So uh, we have a, uh, imagine John thinks that his professor has been witched. No? So this is our example. And we know from studies, or Rathia and his team, uh, they know so that uh, passive constructions, uh, they are more difficult to read for people with uh, disability, reading disabilities than active constructions. So th this means that we need first, we need to analyze to a certain extent so uh, our sentence. And then once we, we are, for example, at the surface syntactic layer, so what we can do is to simplify that is paraphrase. No? So using, for example, again, graph, graph transduction. No? So John think that somebody witched his professor. No? Then, uh, but uh, OK, and then we can regenerate using the standard generation grammars in order to get the simplified sentence. Uh, but uh, the syntactic constructions, they are only half of the story because they are also complex words. No? Uh, uh, here we don't have any, but in principle, no? so it's known that um, complex, uh, uh, let's say, literate words should be avoided uh, when uh, texts are simplified. No? And uh, for this purpose, we use corpus-based complex word detection and then substitution with simpler words. And here, you know, so that's, uh, as I already mentioned, that's Horacio and his team working on this topic. And quite a few members uh, of the group are involved in, in this task. OK, and here we have uh, quite, a, quite a few, again, uh, publications on this, if any is, is interested. OK, now let's move from the sentence to text. No? So you remember that we had uh, the sentence layer, then the text layer, and then uh, so we'll skip this text collection layer. No, so, um, OK, uh, I, I got this uh, or part of this text now from New York Times a couple of days ago. And if we read this, this text, no, so, and if we understand it, no, so, uh, so then we can just looking at terms and looking at the relations between terms, we can grasp what the idea is about. That is what we uh, know. So the, for example, the IBM initiative, the company, so IBM is a company, and the company refers to IBM. Its management workforce, so it's part of the company that is part of the IBM. And companies' quarterly reports got also something to do with IBM, etc. No? So that is, if we identify, as I said, all terms re uh, referring to IBM in one way or the other, and we get the relations between those 
terms, so then we know what the sentence, uh, what the text is about. No, so we have uh, 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 understanding of the text. But uh, a text tells us if we, or we can get out of the text even more. No, so if we look, for example, no, at uh, firms, companies, IBM. No, so we see that firms. Firms and companies, that's kind of uh, quasi-synonyms, quasi more or less. No? So IBM is a, is a company. No? So then, if we have design experts and professional designers. So uh, this, uh, again, we have here synonyms. No? And we have revenues, and we know that revenues got something to do with profits. And we have fields, and here data anal analytics, cloud computing, etc., etc., and, and all, all these uh, fields are also businesses. No? So if we're able to get the relation and we, we are able to identify those terms and relation between them, so what we can do is to construct basically a taxonomy. No? So uh, we can automatically construct a taxonomy, create large lexical resources, which can be then again reused in other NLP applications. And this is what uh, we are doing here in this research uh, topic, automatic induction of taxonomies for compilation of lexical resources. And uh, so uh, first, uh, an important aspect of this work is to identify definitions. For example, we have here, Euphrates was an eminent Stoic philosopher who lived blah, blah. So this is a definition, or uh, yeah. And Euphrates was a native uh, of Tyr, and showed great power as an orator, so this is not a definition. No? So what we need to be able to distinguish between those two different statements, which are, as a matter of fact, rather, rather similar. No? So um, then, so the second, uh, let's say, topic in this uh, area is um, to retrieve relations in uh, definitional statements and here, for uh, uh, go as an example. Notice you have uh, Henri Lafontaine, blah, 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 was a Belgian international lawyer. And a lawyer is a professional who practices law. That's another statement we, uh, we get from somewhere. And professional can be any person who develops a professional activity. So then we should be able, you know, so what is, that's our goal, that we um, deduce uh, this, this chain, you know, so that we, uh, did you that Henri Lafontaine, so that's a Belgian international lawyer. So that's a Belgian international lawyer, that's an international lawyer. And an uh, international lawyer is a lawyer, and a lawyer is a professional, and uh, a professional is a person. So that is, we get now, uh, fully automatically, we get the whole, let's say, line from the bottom to the top. No? So, and it, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, obviously you no. Know, when we do, for example, deep analysis or whatever, you know, so then we are we we ought to use those resources you know, to understand. And so the work goes even further. You no, know, so instead of only pro uh, constructing taxonomies of words, you no. Know, so far we have only words here. So uh, um, the next step is to construct taxonomies of word senses. You know? And here for this, uh, for this purpose, um, uh, uh, yeah, the colleagues are using here uh, word embeddings. So that is, again, uh, let's say, uh, a strategy from uh, deep learning. No? So, and this is uh, uh, Luis Espinosa's work, mainly, and uh, uh, Francesco Ronzano and uh, Horacio. They also participate under the leadership of uh, Horacio. OK. So uh, now, so again, so the next step, you know, so we're now we are focused in this, uh, the previous uh, topic, we focused on, uh, on, let's say, taxonomy specific, taxonomy specific uh, tokens. Now, but the interest uh, goes further. So we want to capture the concept of the whole text. You know? So that is to understand what a text is about. You know? and, um, so for this purpose, we use dependency parsing uh, driven candidate detection. What is a concept? No? So not any, let's say, noun is a concept. So then we uh, identify, uh, use rule-based strategies to identify properties and uh, um, then classify or basically 
typify uh, the, the identified uh, concepts. No? So and here is an example so that it becomes a little bit more concrete. No? So if we have a battery, so then we, uh, we want to know so that it's basically it's something, a concept called battery. If we have a nickel uh, so nickel cadmium battery, no? so uh, we need to understand that it's of the uh, type nickel uh, cadmium or made of nickel cadmium or whatever so it's not just a blue battery no it's different and if we have a first arm and a second arm so then we need to understand which seems trivial but in fact it, it's not for the machine that there are two separate arms no? so and we can uh, uh, do something with one arm and we can do something with the other arm and uh, so then if we have the bottom of the vessel, so then we need to understand that it's uh, the bottom part, you know, that's the bottom part of the object vessel, and the bottom part is, uh, yeah, the bottom. No? So um, and, no, we need to understand this. No? And um, another thing that we need to, uh, to, to be able to do, so let's identify different mentions of the same concept, that is, uh, uh, co-reference, we can need to do co-reference resolution. No? So for, uh, here that's an yeah, uh, easier case, a charging regulator, blah, blah, blah. Their regulator incorporates two switches, so we need to understand that the same uh, regulator. No? And here the upper part and the bottom part of the regulator are to each other, so we need to know, we need to be able to understand that here, so um, we, what we mean, these are uh, two parts and in the semantic representation obviously uh, of this statement what we need to to put not each other um, wouldn't make sense no? so we need to put the uh, upper part and the bottom part no? okay and uh, then so the novelty here is also that we extract open class relations, whatever relation they are between concepts, you know, and instead of uh, focusing on uh, closed set of relations as is often done. Okay, and uh, here who is working on this, that's uh, John, John Codina, Alicia, and uh, Sergio Cajal. Well, uh, let's look another time on uh, at this uh, this text we had no? so we now we move to another topic so uh, here I highlighted in green a couple of uh, let's say word co-occurrences no? hiring experts uh, uh, initiative stands out Re revenues are huge steadily declining fall off in revenue shaved profit etc so at the first glance so there is nothing special about these uh, word co-occurrences, no? So you hire an expert and you hire them, no? So no problem. But uh, it becomes more interesting if we look uh, at uh, other languages, so we think cross-linguistically, no? For example, hire, hire an expert, no? So in, in Spanish, you would say contratar un experto. You wouldn't say, the, you wouldn't use the equivalent of hire. In German, you would say einstellen, so uh, this in Spanish we have an equivalent, colocar a alguien, but it has a very negative connotation. So you wouldn't, uh, if you wouldn't like to translate it as Einstein and colocar a alguien, no? And uh, in, in French, you, know, you would say embaucher or engager to engage someone. In English, you wouldn't say engage someone, no? So that is, uh, okay, so when, uh, and uh, all the same, uh, uh, the way down, no? So that is, these uh, co-occurrences of word combination, they are language specific. So, and uh, in order to generate, for example, no? so generate a text from an abstract representation, we need to, uh, uh, to know what, uh, what, kind of, what kind of combination we use. And uh, not surprising, so language learners tend to have uh, huge problems with this, uh, with these combinations. Now, here we have uh, uh, two examples no, uh, from um, uh, learn corpora. No, pasamos por la universidad. Sorry, that's uh, only in Spanish because we work on Spanish here. Pasamos por la universidad de Vermont. Hicimos un recorreo. 
No? So this is uh, someone, a learner, a Native American English speaker wrote uh, no, in uh, their essay. And here, el pasado fin de semana tomamos un paseo, el tiempo ha sido fantástico, recibimos mucho sol. No? Okay, no? so here we see that and we can imagine that it's not that trivial. No? So why, for example, so uh, here occurs tomamos un paseo? Because in English you say to take a walk. No? And, and the, uh, the learners, they tend to translate from their native language or from uh, another, let's say L1 language, to the second language. No? So that is uh, what we want to be able uh, is first to be able to recognize when we have those word co-occurrences, what we call collocations, and uh, compile resources. So we have, uh, for example, dictionaries, which can be used both for language learners and for automatic purposes. And we also want to be able to recognize the miscollocations and be able to correct them. No? Okay, so uh, first collocation recognition and classification. No? So um, first we need to uh, identify collocations in native corpora and for this purpose we use a normalized pointwise mutual information from information theory. It's uh, normalized or we need to normalize it because uh, we need to take into account the asymmetric nature of those uh, co-occurrences. And then uh, we use uh, supervised uh, machine learning, again, a support vector machine, that's our standard vehicle, uh, uh, to classify. You know? So in here we see uh, an, uh, how the system uh, uh, performs right now. So uh, with café, you know? so tomar, beber, uh, apurar. You know? So this, all, this all means that, uh, well, the same color means that they are basically considered to be the same, to express the same semantics. You know? Okay, and in theory, what we want to be able to say, okay, to take a, uh, to take a walk and to make a suggestion that's um, basically the same semantics of take and make in this uh, case, in this context. No? Because uh, take and make basically avoid of any semantics, no? so they just signal, so uh, not of any semantics, they, they have an abstract semantics of, let's say, uh, to perform something. No? And we uh, want to be able to say that heavy storm and huge revenue are also of the same class. Mm? And, uh, uh, okay, so uh, <coughs> who is involved here, that's uh, John, that's uh, Sara Rodriguez and uh, Roberto Calini. And what we started to work on, which is really very promising, with uh, Luis using uh, word embeddings to, um, um, to have a, an example-based retrieval and classification of collocations. No? So I um, want to be able to say, look for any um, collocations of the, uh, that are the same in their same as heavy storm. No? So here we do it uh, in two steps, and here we want uh, to do it in, uh, in the first step. And that's the, uh, the, the first results are really very, very promising and very exciting. You know? So we all submitted a publication on this, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm very happy about this work. So then the miscollocation recognition and classification. So uh, yeah, so we, first we need to identify what is wrong about uh, uh, something. You know? So <coughs> we identify miscollocations using distance to valid collocations we have from our reference corpora. And um, then we classify miscollocations with respect to a given typology you know, in order then to be able to correct them. You know? OK. Um, so, and here again, that's uh, Sara and Roberto who are involved, um, heavily involved in this. Okay, so, um, well, another, uh, another uh, let's say, a research topic, again, this text, yeah? So, what is, uh, what is uh, so far we looked at the, uh, this text as such, but if we're doing, let's say, generation, text generation, so then we need to, uh, <coughs> to look behind, behind the text. 
what is be, what comes before the text. And uh, basically, in a very abstract way, this is what is behind the text. You know? So if we think, of, for example, of DBpedia or other large scale uh, resources, ontological resources, so this is what we have. Uh, and in order to generate, for example, uh, a short statement on, I don't know, so Albert Einstein or whatever, so then we need to be able to select the appropriate content from this mess. Uh, Okay, and uh, what is else behind this text? You know? So there is uh, what we call discourse structure. So it's not a text is usually not a, let's say, um, unordered sequence of unrelated sentences. A text is a text because, oh, no, uh, um, ideally, let's say, ideally. No? So uh, there is a red thread through the whole uh, text. And what we want to, uh, to have is kind of this identify this structure. So we uh, we have uh, when we look at this uh, text. So while its revenues are huge, the company's quarterly report. Blah, blah, blah. So there is a relation between those two statements. No, and here the fall off in revenue is partly intentional as the company sold off. No? That's the justification of it. No? So that is if we um, we use this uh, let's say set of different relations. So we get. Uh, a graph, or in the, in the simple case, it's a tree, a, a, a discourse tree. No? So, and what we want to do is uh, when we do tax planning, no? uh, so this is first to plan what information should be communicated in, uh, in a text. No? So, and this obviously depends on the goals of the, uh, of the writer, that is the machine, or the addressee, etc., etc., the context in which it's written. So, and for this purpose, we use uh, graph navigation techniques, no? so there's also distance metrics. No? So the reinforcement, the um, plate with the reinforcement learning a lot, and also supervised learning, no? so annotating corpora <coughs> with uh, data, uh, data structures. And uh, then the second step is planning the discourse structure of the text that is to be generated. No? And for this purpose, we use this uh, structure we just saw. No? So this, uh, uh, let's say, um, rhetorical structure theory. OK, and uh, so that's um, Gerard, Gerard Casamayor's uh, work. His PhD uh, is uh, exactly on this topic. Hmm? OK, <coughs> let's now uh, get to the last branch of our activities. Yeah, OK. So that's a meta-analysis of written discourse. So um, look at this text. No, so that's another one. So uh, uh, there was uh, this, I think that this went through the press. No? So, uh, and I highlighted here a uh, some, um, some parts which are uh, really um, yeah, striking. No? So this was, this was a publication, uh, an article in The Onion uh, newspaper, that's the satirical newspaper, and so uh, um, curious enough, no? so not all readers really got the message that it's satirical. No? So for, for example, there was a, a statement by uh, an uh, uh, FIFA official from Trinidad who welcomed, no? so in his Twitter, welcomed the uh, uh, soccer copy in the US, blah, blah, blah. No? So he took it for serious. And there, uh, the Chinese press is notoriously known for uh, uh, taking this for uh, seriously. No? So they republish no? so, uh, the, the articles, etc. No? So there, uh, we, there, there is a need no, to say those people, hey, this is uh, a satirical text, or this is uh, sarcasm, or whatever. No? So, um, uh, so this is about uh, recognition of figurative language in multilingual social media, first of all. No? For example, here we see a couple of examples. Uh, <coughs> which are uh, satirical, uh, and um, okay, no. So the, here, so uh, it's uh, uh, work being done in Horacio's team you know, by uh, Francesco uh, Barbieri, Francesco Ranzano, and Horacio himself. You know? So there uh, are again a couple of uh, reference publications. Okay, so uh, author profiling. 
No? So if we have this, again, this text, now who has written this text? No? So wo was it a man or was it a woman? How old is the author? What is their professional background, uh, et cetera, et cetera, native law? Uh, and this is uh, uh, John Soler, who is uh, looking at those questions. And um, OK, just give you an example here. No? So from uh, a couple of studies we did. And you see here some, uh, some uh, features, like use of quotes, question marks, colons, semicolons, and commas, and across language and across, ge across genders. You know? so, and here, you know, so if we want to, to uh, get something political out of it, we can compare Spanish and Catalan writers. You know? so, and there are uh, quite, uh, quite a few differences if we look into other, other features. No? OK. so. Um, Integration of tunnel research into broad applications. I very briefly, I'm running out of time, so I'm going very briefly through this. So uh, w uh, the, one of the projects we are working on, so that's the co Christina Conversational Agent, and here we're collaborating with uh, GTI, with Josep, and with uh, computer vision people. And uh, what we're doing, basically everything what has been, or nearly everything what has been mentioned before. No? So we are doing uh, analysis, we are doing, uh, let's say, semantic representation, and here we are doing then, so the generation part. So the idea is to develop a, a socially competent conversational agent, which <coughs> speaks in Arabic, Polish, and Turkish, uh, with uh, migrants. Why Arabic? Because in Spain there are many Arabic immigrants who do not speak uh, Spanish or Catalan or, or whatever, so they need to be uh, talked to in Arabic. Why Turkish? Because in Germany, so there are uh, many Turkish migrants and the elderly uh, who now come to residences uh, uh, for elderly, they have huge problems. No? So uh, conversate with uh, Personnel and uh, why Polish? Because the Germans, what they do, they hire Polish caregivers for three months without caring whether they speak the language or not. And uh, then after three months, so they they uh, they didn't learn uh, German. So they they go home back and so on. No? So there is a, a, again a, a huge social problem in this. No, so and we are trying to get. Um, a solution for this. No? So here, so uh, GTI is working obviously on uh, their expertise domain, so that's um, generation of the avatar and uh, uh, the computer vision people on uh, facial and body action parameter extraction. Okay, so and here there are quite a few people involved in this project. Okay, multi-center, so that's uh, the uh, the uh, goal of the multi-sensor is to extract uh, information from the web and uh, summarize this information uh, tuned to the profile of the user. And here we are involved in content extraction, content summarization. Okay, again, uh, so quite a few people. So uh, Dr. Inventor, no, so that's a special interesting uh, project for uh, us here, no, so that's the goal is to support scientists in uh, their creativity and uh, to assess their research, how good actually their research is compared to the state of the art, to compare to other publications. No, so and here, so uh, obviously, Tallinn is involved in uh, or covers the natural language processing part, and that's Oracia, Oracia's team. Uh, that's working on this. IPAD doc, you no, know, so that's about patents. So I'll, uh, and again, what we're doing here, obviously taking care of the whole natural language processing chain. Okay, and the last one, so that's able to include, that's about simplification and uh, inclusion of um, <coughs> impaired people into, let's say, the whole normal society communication process because the European legislation, for example, so states that the, uh, no person mu must be uh, 
in disadvantage because of their disabilities, etc. So that, legally speaking, so every text which is around, whatever is published, must be simplified, must be adapted to the needs of the uh, impaired people. No? So, and here, so that's the processing chain. Obviously, this is a project specifically about simplification. Okay, so here are the different steps. And again, that's, um, that's Horatio. Now, NLP in the world, my last slide. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, NLP is basically central to, to everything, no? So, <laughs> without being modest. Uh, okay, so uh, if we look at, um, uh, it, um, yeah, any application which is where the user is involved, no? So let's say problem solving, decision support. Nowadays, you need, if you want to interact with the user, you ought to do it in natural language, no? So you, need, you ought to explain uh, to the to the user what uh, what it is about what the uh, what uh, the solution looks like etc. You look at this computer uh, computer application, so I see a lot of of uh, potential. For example, and uh, what uh, uh, Rafa is doing, uh, Rafa posts, you no. Know, so for uh, natural language, intelligent social agents, of course, information search. Even uh, if uh, Ricardo for, uh, wouldn't admit it. So, uh, so I think that uh, natural language is uh, a huge asset for information search and especially question answering, knowledge acquisition, information access, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Forensic, you know, uh, whatever, yeah, you name it, we can discuss how we can put natural language into it. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Sorry for uh, being over time. So, and yeah, if you have any questions, uh, uh, so you are very welcome. Thanks. Methodology is just not good enough. And uh, so we speak to a certain uh, um, extent. We sp uh, we speak rule based, but uh, uh, there uh, it's very expensive to hire linguists who would write a complete grammar for uh, let's say for for Catalan. No? So for a generation grammar, as you saw. So we have different ways. So so you would need to sit down and to work really to spell it out, no? And uh, this, this is just too expensive, no? So there are, there are systems, for example, machine learning systems um, that are still rule-based, no? So if we think of, uh, yeah, the, the famous system, no? So, or uh, there are other companies who are really successful in rule-based uh, machine translation, but uh, that's uh, niches, no? So it's uh, on a large scale, you can't do it. Just partially related to that, how do you see like what the giants like Google and so is doing and how you get models which are useful for the research community out of that? Or is this just a total different parallel chain of... Uh, no, so, uh, okay, no, so, so what Google is doing is purely machine learning based, no, so as, as you know. So uh, there is, a, we collaborate with people from Google, you know, so a former student of mine, you know, this is now uh, doing parsing, is one of the uh, key persons you know, so for parsing in, in Google. So we're collaborating with them. So, um, and they publish their research, you know, so uh, we can all profit from it. You know? So and they are investing a lot of money into annotation of corpora, three banks we need for training. So this is also then publicly available. So, so we we get something out of them. So follow up on that uh, yeah. question. So uh, th this move to machine learning and uh, all that mm -hmm. promise also relates to the fact that there is abundance of data now. Okay. So exactly. And and one of the striking things is uh, the amount of things that you can do with natural language and other things, uh, extract the information and so on without understanding anything. Okay. So. Uh, so yes. the, the question is whether this move to supervise machine learning methods, in a sense, so is taking sort of researchers away from the goal of understanding uh, and getting a semantic representation of uh, of a natural language sentence like text and so on, and just uh -huh. sort of moving slightly to yeah. extracting useful information from text without necessarily understanding them. So uh, I, I think that it uh, will always be useful, and uh, there will be always an add-on if we understand what uh, the whole story is about. No, so we, did an, um, we didn't do any experiments with information extraction, 
but we did some experiments with parsing. So uh, we took a parser and then we uh, looked at it you know, where it uh, goes wrong and uh, applying our linguistic knowledge. You know, so we uh, developed a, a, a multiple SVM. You know, so just to, uh, to take into account the linguistic facts and we improved quite a lot. No, so uh, it's not hopeless for linguists. No, so that's the message. No? So we'll always need the understanding of the language. Mm? Just a yeah. question. Just a question here. Um, how do you? How do you, you? You you briefly touched on accuracy yes. just earlier in one of the uh, in one of the uh, your answers. How do you actually measure accuracy? So in parsing, so we have. Uh, um, we have al always a, a ground truth, a gold standard, and then we, we have, uh, uh, so in parsing, we, uh, there, there are um, very, very concrete measure, no, measures, so, so uh, um, labeled, unlabeled attachment score, so that is in how many cases we get the relations, we attach the relations right, then labeled attachment score, uh, precision accuracy, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we have a ground truth, no? So and then we, let's say, assess. Yeah, but in, oh. in in general, you can never test against a ground truth, right? For an arbitrary. Uh, no, so okay, uh, for an arbitrary, uh, obviously, no. So uh, I can only say so. Uh, well, I I need to select my ground truth, no? So adequately, so it's representative. And then I can only say here, you know, so yes. this is what uh, my uh, parse, my generator, whatever, uh, is able to perform on the on the ground truth. No, obviously, it uh, uh, it's probable. It's an approximation. If you get something, you no. Know, so what we have and now, uh, uh, and okay, you no. Know, so parsing, uh, let's say in in the Christina project, parsing of spoken language nothing to do with the ground truth we have for written language. No? So it, uh, it's, it performs much poorer. No? So, uh, yeah. But in, uh, in the end, in a, in a generic uh, case, then it's perceptual, right? If you don't have any, any, any ground truth to compare with, then it's, uh, I mean, you can probably parameterize or give a, kind of a quality yes, if parameter, but yeah. then yeah, if if if, uh, if there is no ground truth, so then it's um, perception that's uh, qualitative evaluation. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm wondering if you in your machine learning structure you are applying some dimensional or you have some dimensional problems since since you are extracting too much information. And you had a lot of feature, and so I'm wondering if you apply in some feature selection methods, especially uh, machine learning also. So we, we do a lot of feature engineering. Yeah. Yeah. So that's for sure. But we, uh, we don't experience any problems uh, with uh, feature vectors that would be too, too large. No? So, but obviously, no, so there is. Uh, there's a lot of feature engineering, as I say, behind it. You know? So uh, some features for some tasks, some features are just useless or they are uh, even can impede uh, 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 good performance. You know? So yeah. don't have any dimensional problems. Dimensional problems, no. Last question. Uh, you said that uh, you are work with uh, a lot of support button machines. Mm -hmm. Uh, trying to classify something, and so property machine is a binary classifier. So I'm wondering uh, if you have so um, high mm -hmm. computational cost in training step. So you uh, actually you can do uh, uh, well uh, multiple class yeah. classification with support vector machines. It's not uh, no. so. Your uh, the machine learning people will. We'll answer it better. No, so, but uh, yes, you, you can actually you can do multiple class uh, classification uh, with support vector machines. It's not uh, per se; it's a binary classifier, but you can tune it to have uh, multiple classes.
please elaborate a little bit about the tool, the text simplification tool that you mentioned? It seemed very interesting and inclusive. How is it being used? Is it available? Does it include that? The, okay. Those things that you mentioned, like the passive and the complex word detection. Okay, these so <laughs> uh, for this, I, I think that uh, Horacio would be more appropriate to answer this question because it's uh, his work you know, on text simplification. So, uh, uh, another seminar, yes. <laughs> Okay, the tool is uh, being developed. So the Spanish tool is already available, and the English tool is being developed, and uh, the project is still running for another year and a half. So the idea is that the libraries, the software libraries, will be available for any developer to integrate in tools. So it will be free software, and uh, all the resources will be available. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you and thank you, Leo. Thanks so much.